Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted uh, to be joined now by the former EU Agricultural Trade Commissioner and our Agricultural Commissioner and Trade Commissioner, uh, Phil Hogan. Phil is going to give us his view, having, I suppose, played a, an integral role in the shaping of, of the CAP uh, in his time as Agricultural Commissioner, what he uh, sees as the incentives and restrictions of the next CAP uh, to farmers. Phil, you're very welcome virtually to West Cork. Thank you very much, uh, Justin, and uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, fellow participants and ladies and gentlemen. I'm grateful to be invited to participate in this event uh, organized by Ludgate and Skibbereen and thank Gronia and all of the team in Ludgate for the fantastic job they're doing. I had the privilege of visiting there in 2016 when I, we were involved at European level in Cork City in developing the Cork 2 Declaration, which was a uh, better life in rural areas. So it was a good example about what was happening in rural areas and, and in West Cork at the time. And uh, my only regret is that we cannot be there in Skibbereen physically, but that's the way we are in these times. So I suppose, Justin, I'm asked to look at the common agricultural policy uh, in Ireland. Uh, I suppose it's asking to look at a crystal ball in some respects because, uh, you know, we have a very changing times at the moment in the context of the pandemic and in the context of the common agricultural policy discussions that are going on between the Council and the Parliament at the moment. Uh, so while the CAP has been a cornerstone of the European policy for nearly 60 years and has supported generations of Irish farmers over the last nearly 50 years, we also need to look at the future of agricultural policy through the prism of the contribution that agriculture can make uh, to other policies, notably in relation to environment and climate policy. And this is not new and farmers are already familiar with the requirements that they have to comply with, like the nitrates directive, the constraints that are associated with what is referred to as calendar farming. And in particular now we have this uh, new uh, I suppose, flagship policy of the European Commission, the European Green Deal. And it's key subsets of this Green Deal, of course, are the farm to fork and the biodiversity strategies. So they have to be integrated into whatever we're talking about on the agricultural side. And speaking about the farm to fork and the biodiversity strategy, the Commission's uh, European Vice President, Franz Timmermans, who was in charge of implementing the Green Deal, said that they were at the heart of the Green Deal, uh, all of these policies regarding farm to fork and biodiversity, and they point to a new and better balance of nature, food systems and biodiversity to protect our people's health and well-being, and at the same time to increase the EU's competitiveness and resilience. These strategies are a crucial part of the great transition we are embarking upon. So that's a fairly serious statement from the Vice President. And it's perhaps worth recalling the state of play as well, where we're at in these negotiations and how those type of sentiments are going to feed in to the final outcome. So I suppose after two years or two and a half years since I published my proposal, the, the Council and the Parliament are just really getting down to serious business now in the last two months. Uh, and they are involved in what we call trialogues, which are meetings that brings together the Council of Ministers and the Parliament to try and tease out a bit like in the Oireachtas, the, the committee and report stages of the legislation. And that's the, where the really the important meat is on any proposal and how it actually is impacting the farmer and impacting the business of agriculture. So reflecting on the increasing prioritization of environment and climate, the 2018 budget proposal included a focus as well on setting higher ambitions for agriculture and climate. And three of the nine objectives of the CAP reform proposal were dedicated to climate action, environmental uh, care, and the preservation of landscapes and biodiversity. So the focus now reflects the extent to which climate and environmental considerations are really beginning to influence agricultural policy. And, uh, and, and the Commission proposal sets out a new green architecture for the CAP, and it, it features strengthened mandatory requirements and increased funding opportunities for green farming. So it moves the goalposts a little bit in the direction of green farming and an emphasis on funding in that direction. Now, I, I, I regret very much it's taken so long for the co-legislators, the Parliament and the Council to take so long to come up with their respective positions. I think this should have been done in 2019 and it should have been done before the European elections, in my view, because you, know, you see the fragmentation of the European Parliament, which has brought about some of this delay. Uh, so anyway, we are where we are. Uh, in fact, the last... Uh, cap reform under the Irish presidency in 2013 took 42 committee stage meetings in order to get a final outcome. So I hope that we'll be able to do it in much more speedier fashion uh, on this occasion, but I, I, I won't hold my breath. 
So I'm not going to comment on the positions taken by the Council of Parliament, uh, though both have been criticised for watering down the Commission's environment and climate ambition. However, this is a view that's rejected by the German presidency of the, Agric of the Agricultural Council, Mrs. Kluckner, who insisted that the Council's amendments to the Commission's proposal have actually increased the level of ambition for the environment and climate. So there's a difference of opinion here. She was reported to have suggested that comments made by Vice President Timmermans recently was talking utter nonsense when he apparently suggested that the cap reform could undermine the environmental status quo. So that's interesting, that type of conflict that's going on between the Council and the Commission on that issue about the level of ambition and the, uh, in the final outcome that we can hope to see. But as you can see, Vice President Timmermans' presence uh, in this debate and his active participation, uh, uh, you know, in addition to the Agricultural Commissioners, this is the first time it has ever happened. So therefore, the Commissioner uh, in that very senior position of the Commission is taking an active role to ensure that agriculture plays its part in environment and climate. So this is a new dimension as well. So the contradictory positions of the German presidency and some members of the European Parliament, Timmermans, are going to play out in the, in the trilogues. So we have to wait and see, and it'll take maybe a month or two before this is concluded. On the budget, the cap is also a very important core source of income, an essential support of income, essential source of income support for many farmers and millions of farmers throughout Europe, and at least tens of thousands of Irish farmers. And it has traditionally taken, and indeed continues to take a very significant share of the budget around 30%, although it has been coming down in recent times. In July, the European Council proposed a CAP budget at current prices of 386.7 billion euro. This is made up of 200 million 91 billion in the first pillar for direct payments and market measures, and 95.6 billion in pillar two for rural development. Now, I should just mention that on this current versus constant price argument, uh, as Alan Mattis, I'm sure, will confirm in the next uh, uh, contributions, contributors, he has acknowledged that there was never a commitment that direct payments to be inflation proofed. In fact, we have no inflation proofing of direct payments since 1992. So in my view, the Council and the, and the Parliament will be very wise to try and reach a speedy agreement on the next CAP. Apart from giving farmers much needed certainty and predictability about the regulatory regime within which they have to operate, it will also give them predictability for their financial institutions in terms of their budget. And make no mistake about it, if the Commission, uh, which Mr Timmermans has threatened to withdraw the proposal, if they did withdraw the proposal, uh, I think that this would cause serious problems in terms of the stability and predictability that farmers want. But my judgment is that they will not uh, withdraw this proposal, notwithstanding the fact that there will be a difference of opinion between the institutions on the level of environment ambition. So nothing should be taken for granted, and we were wise to do so. So, but agriculture, I'm glad to say, has still many friends, but they're becoming fewer and less influential when compared to the champions of the new priorities of the Green Deal. And you will see many uh, occasions where uh, people will be addressing the European Parliament, the European Council, that will not be always taking agriculture into account in terms of meeting other policy priorities of the European Union. But I'm certain of one clear political message, and if, uh, if I didn't propose enhanced environmental ambition in 2018, there was no chance of protecting 95% of the budget at that, on, in the same year, notwithstanding the fact that we didn't have any contribution from the UK because of Brexit. So. Then we got this extra 750 billion during the course of the summer of 2020 from the French and German initiative. And that gave an additional amount of money to farmers, which gave, gave us, brought us up to the 386.7. So the budget is protected, but it's protected on the basis of delivering on societal concerns and public goods. And that's a political reality. Now, there's many people, of course, who take a lazy temptation to demonize farmers in relation to their activities on the environment, particularly dairy farmers. And I've always put farmers at the centre of the solution rather than being accused of being part of the problem. And I've always argued the point with my fellow commissioners that we need to have, you know, who are the people that are going to deliver on the, on the land? Who are the, the people that are going to deliver the biodiversity strategy, the landscape strategy, the, the better soil conditions and the better, the reduction in emissions uh, if we don't have farmers centrally involved as part of the solution? So we have to incentivize to do the, to, the, and reward them for doing so. And this precisely for these reasons that in our 2018 proposals, the Commission set out a new green architecture featuring strengthened mandatory requirements and increased funding opportunities for green farming. 
Amongst the specific measures that were proposed were the preservation of soils through requirements to protect carbon rich wetlands and practice crop rotation. There was an obligatory nutrient management tool, which was designed to help farmers to improve their water quality and reduce ammonia and, ox and nitrous oxide uh, levels on their farms. There was a new stream of funding from the CAPS direct, direct payment budget for eco schemes, which will support and incentivize farmers to undertake certain agricultural practices that are beneficial for climate, biodiversity and the environment. And unfortunately, there have been efforts to water these down, uh, especially the enhanced conditionality requirements on Pillar 1, which seems to be a source of particular annoyance to Mr Timmermans. But such an approach provides ammunition then for the naysayers to try and get the proposal withdrawn. And this would be disastrous for farmers, in my view, as, uh, and doesn't and uh, uh, removes the certainty and predictability they want, and also could threaten the budget. You, you, you could play itself in to the final outcome in the budgetary discussions. So I'm very conscious that I am at least virtually in the heart of dairy country. And the Irish dairy sector has seen massive growth since the welcome abolition of quotas in 2015. Tens of thousands of people employed in the sector and with over 2.5 billion invested in new capacity and other physical facilities to process and add value to Irish milk. The sector is an economic powerhouse for the country. It's delivering over 11 billion euro right, last year right across the country. So I'm also familiar with the good work that's been done by Dairy Sustainability Ireland. Their initiative is very much to be welcomed. It improves the sustainability of the growing sector and the dairy sector, but it demonstrates not alone an understanding by the dairy industry of the sustainability ch uh, challenge, but a desire to embrace that challenge. And Dairy Sustainability Ireland clearly realised that the consumer markets that Tara McCarthy was speaking about earlier, in Europe or in Asia or anywhere around the world, they are demanding more information about the production systems, about the sustainability of production in agriculture and food. And farmers will be very wise to listen to that message. That said, the current nitrates derogation allows farmers to be stocked at a maximum of 250 kg organic nitrogen per hectare, average across all hectares. On farms with only dairy cows, this is a maximum stocking rate of 2.8 cows per hectare. However, on many dairy farm, farms, the grazing platform is stocked higher than the overall farm average. And the Department of Agriculture has already said it plans to review grazing pla platform stocking rates in the next Nitrate Action Programme review, which is coming in 2021. So clean water is essential for life, it's essential for the environment, it's essential for jobs, it's essential for agriculture. And when nutrient levels increase in water, the oxygen level is depleted, resulting in loss of marine life. And in this water quality report, the European or the Environmental Protection Agency found that the quality of almost half of river sources in Ireland is unsatisfactory. And the number of pristine waters has fallen to an all time low. Clean water is not an optional extra. 7,000 Irish dairy farmers avail of the nitrates derogation and a full review of the derogation and the nitrates action plan will take place next year. It will be a challenge against the backdrop of the EPA or water quality report to get the right result and a balanced outcome. You may recall that in December 2017, I warned about the gulf between what I described as the welcome rhetoric of ensuring that a significant increase in food production is not considered in isolation from its environmental impact, particularly in relation to the depletion of natural resources and the potential impact on climate change. I did express concern at that time that the risks of failing to address the environmental challenge are not abstract, they are real and they can be counted in hard currency. So initiatives since then indicate to me that these messages have not alone been heard, but they are being heeded. Indeed, this, this is reflected in the EPA figures which were published last week, which show that agricultural emissions decreased last year by 3.9%, driven by reduced fertilizer use and lime use on soils. So there's a welcome news, a welcome direction. As welcome as these figures are though, I know that there is an acknowledgement that more needs to be done. And these efforts need to be supported. As one player in the Irish dairy sector said to me recently, the cap will be fundamental. It provides an opportunity to embrace the sustainability agenda and get ahead of it. The industry needs to focus on win-wins. After all, good water and soil quality can deliver profitability benefits as well as environmental benefits. This is where we need to look beyond the first pillar, direct payments, when we look at the CAP. Irish dairy farmers have been very proactive through their participation in schemes such as the Sustainability Dairy Assurance Scheme, the Agricultural Sustainability Support and Advisory Programme, which is a new collaborative approach to improving water quality with which 
uh, with the necessary funds and support provided by the dairy processing co-ops. The cap exists to accompany farmers to make the transition to a more sustainable form of agricultural production right across Europe. However, much will depend on the choices that are made by the government in terms of its use of the second pillar funds and the extent to which governments prepare to co-fund these European Union funds. The second pillar is crucial in assisting farmers to make the necessary adaptations by funding important investments by Irish farmers, bearing in mind that one of the six priorities for rural development policy is promoting resource efficiency and supporting the shift towards a low carbon and climate resilient economy in the agricultural food and forestry sectors. So given the budgetary pressures, the MFF proposals allow national governments to increase their co-funding co rates to ensure that there is no reduction in the level of uh, public funding for the second pillar of the CAP. And I hope that the government will provide the full national co-funding allowed, not least to ensure that the investments that, is, that I'm talking about that are essential will be made. And given the contribution that the agri-food sector made to the post-economic crash at the end of the last decade, I think we can all agree that the sector has the potential to make a similar contribution to a post-COVID recovery, particularly if the ambitious and challenging growth projections set out in Foodwise 25 are to be achieved. So knowledge and innovation are essential for a smart, for a resilient and sustainable agricultural sector, the cap of the future will both encourage increased investment in research and innovation and enable farmers and rural communities to benefit from it. As a public representative, I was always a great fan of the REP scheme. And the whole of farm approach is one which in my view is essential if we're, to, if we're serious about improving the sustainability of agricultural production in Ireland. And in that respect, the targeted agricultural modernization schemes, TAMS, could also prove to be a very useful vehicle for helping farmers to continue the transition to greater sustainability. There will also be specific programs for farmers made available in the next few years regarding the structural economy. And this could be very important for rural communities in terms of creating jobs in a more value added way off farm. And I think that that's well worth looking at from an agri environment point of view for communities like West Cork. Before I finish, Justin, I'd like to just briefly refer back to the farm to fork and the biodiversity strategies. In addition to the cap, it is strategies like these that will increasingly influence agricultural policy in the years ahead. And there's no point in burying our heads in the sand and saying that it's going to go away. It's not. We have to embrace this strategy, these strategies, and build on these strategies to ensure that we have results for farmers and results for the community and society as a whole. It's significant and important to note that neither the farm to fork strategy nor the biodiversity strategies are the responsibility of the Department of Agriculture in Brussels. The farm to fork strategy includes a number of very specific and ambitious 2030 tar targets. And these include actions to reduce the use of chemical and more hazardous pesticides by 50%, to reduce nutrient losses by at least 50%, while ensuring no deterioration in soil fertility, to reduce fertilizer use by at least 20%, to reduce the sale of antimicrobials for farmed animals and in agriculture by 50%, and achieve a 25% uh, of total farming being used for organic farming by 2030. It's only in the, you know, this is only a few years away where all of these targets have to be met. They're challenging and they may well be legislated for where we might have no choice. And if that is the case, there is likely to be some resistance, of course, in the debate between the council and the parliament before we complete matters in the next couple of months. While pushback is understandable, you can see the direction of travel. The potential consequence should be fully understood. Resistance is likely to be interpreted as a demonstration of unwillingness on the part of farmers to play their full part, and that could have consequences in the next MFF. The strongest argument farmers have for a well-funded CAP, in my view, is to show clearly that they have embraced and delivered on the commitments on climate and environment. Anything short of such a wholehearted commitment would, in my view, be short-sighted and very risky. The common agricultural policy has been here for more than half a century and is here to stay, not least because it's provided for in the treaty. But its strength over the decades has been its ability to adapt and evolve to the challenging circumstances, whether they relate to enlargement or changing farming practices or climate change. Agricultural production faces new and emerging challenges all the time. And apart from the climate challenge, we see big changes in consumer demand, with reductions in demand for meat and dairy based products and a huge increase in in alternatives to dairy and meat, especially plant-based foods. 
Likewise, the EU's open trade policy is providing significant opportunities to grow our exports, not least in the dairy sector. The main focus of the CAP, particularly in Ireland, has been to provide income support for farmers, many of whom complain about having to produce for less than the cost of production. If farmers are to make the full transition to a more sustainable form of agricultural production, the CAP of the future will have to accompany them on this journey. That means that member state governments will have to make critical decisions about the CAP and how it can be tailored to the particular circumstances that apply to those member states so that farmers are equipped to meet the challenges that face them. So therefore the work being done by the likes of Chagas and the Dairy Sustainability Ireland and individual co-ops like Carberry is essential and proposals for a whole of government, whole of sector collaborative agreement of a common plan of objectives seems to me to represent a sensible way to proceed. And that's what I provided for in the 2018 proposals to the CAP strategic plan. So my crystal ball doesn't allow me to go any further to foresee what the CAP of the future will look like, just, but, uh, I, uh, but I certainly I hope that the, uh, these ideas will give you some indication of my thinking. Uh, we have to assess what incentives and uh, restraints it may present in the future. But what I can say is that it will continue to involve the CAP and will continue to evolve very much in the direction of using the farming opportunity through the CAP to have a better environmental and climate focus. And to ensure that the funding of the CAP is maximised, I urge all those involved in the sector that they are primary producer or processor to continue their efforts to embrace and engage with all of these uh, objectives. Everything has to be seen through the prism of sustainability and the CAP has a part to play in helping farmers to make the transition and to accelerate the good work that has been done in recent years. Thank you. Bill, thank you very much for that and for those great insights. And just maybe to tease out uh, something, because I'm very conscious that in this uh, panel in this debate we want to give farmers in uh, foresight in terms of what may be coming down the tracks and obviously you're ideally positioned to, to, to comment on that. The nitrates derogation, if I was a young farmer setting out a business plan for the next 15 years for my business, should I be prepared, should I be planning for a nitrates derogation to be in place or should I be plan contingency planning for the potential that the nitrates derogation uh, is removed? Well I think you, you should plan on the basis that we have to make a lot of progress in relation to water quality in the future. And we have to take it more seriously, perhaps, than we did in the past in terms of investment. I think Irish water needs to be given a lot more capital funding because a lot of the, a lot of the investment that's required uh, has, uh, you know, if you see the EPA report around urban areas and village areas, is to with schemes that are, are, are waiting a long, long time for capital mm. investment. And this would, of course, bring about consequential knock-on benefits to the rural communities as well. But everybody has to play their part, whether they're urban authorities, or government agencies, but also if they want the farmer to be involved, they have to incentivize them to ensure that the, uh, that, the, that the soil conditions, that the water quality are married together for the benefit of everybody. I would say to a young farmer that's starting off that take, take account of the fact that there is good, going to be a lot more constraints in relation to water quality in the future. And that take account of, uh, and take a, a very conservative view in relation to what is required of that farmer in relation to environmental sustainability and and that and those constraints that inevitably will occur because that's what the consumer is going to require and that's what the agencies and authorities are going to insist upon well you obviously have a deep understanding of ireland and irish agriculture and we've seen calls recently in terms of an ongoing calls to reduce the size of our national herd in terms of the whole climate debate and carbon emissions and whatnot uh would you share any of your views on that oh well, now you want to be here for the rest of the day the government minister coming on very shortly i'm sure she'd have a view on that but all i would say is that uh, this sort of soundbite mentality about reducing the national herd is not the answer what we have to do is make sure that we're carbon efficient and that we uh, were able to engage in the next in the technologies that we spoke about earlier in order to ensure that farmers are able to play their part in reducing uh, emissions to the extent that they're sustainable in terms of the marketplace for consumer demands but also able to ensure by doing that that they're delivering on behalf of society in the common agricultural policy to merit the type of budget support that they will want to get in five six years time and just finally, Phil, obviously you had your finger very much in the pulse in relation to Brexit. Uh, how concerned are you? Well, as you can see, a lot of the, the details uh, that would have emerged in terms of meat products in recent days is a perfect example of how, you know, the, 
day-to-day -day difficulties that we spoke about before the referendum are now not simple to resolve. And the European side will be insisting on uh, ensuring the integrity of the single market is protected. The hybrid solution that was agreed in the withdrawal agreement, we now see that it's not easy to implement in terms of checks and controls to make sure that, that the single market is maintains its full integrity. As a, that's a, it's just one example of, a, of the type of practical issues that will arise on a day-to-day -day basis for companies in the Republic and in, in Northern Ireland and indeed into the UK. So hopefully they will be able to solve this in the coming days. I expect that there's going to be some sort of an agreement, uh, but I don't think it's going to make everybody on any side happy. Uh, the mandates of each side will have to be adjusted, uh, in my view, in the coming week to reflect the fact that we are, you know, that there is going to be a deal of some description, but I suspect that it will be laced with considerable amount of words like transitions and reviews in order to get us through this particular period. Uh, you know, people should take note of what Mr. Gove said in September, the, minister, the cabinet minister mm -hmm. who was in charge of the matters relating to Brexit implementation, uh, when he let the genie out of the bottle about having to get a permit to go into the county of Kent on your way to Dover if you're a truck driver from the UK or indeed the Republic of Northern Ireland. That was the first real indication of a wake-up call that, they, uh, that businesses were getting about the need to be proactive in, in getting ready for the 1st of January. It will not be simple. And already they made the fundamental decision in the UK last January to go out for the single market and the customs union. And all of this deal is what this negotiation is trying to do is mitigate the damage of that. So it won't be easy, uh, but we'll see the, the, the outcome in, in the coming week. Could we see transition move to implementation phase, Phil, sort of to buy, not to buy more time, but to maybe allow measures to, to settle in? Well, politically, Boris Johnson uh, has done everything he possibly can to ensure that the, 30, the 1st of January 2021 is D-Day for being out of the European Union. He wants to take back control in every possible way, and he's now seeing the difficulty of these words and taking back control in terms of the implementation phase. I, I'm not in a position to, to say what, the, uh, what words will be on the pages, but I, all I do know is that there will be a problems in January 2021 that will be, take some time to grapple with. Phil Hogan, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you.